there friends, my name is Rachel Giannis Middle and I'm here on behalf of Forbear Theatre to explore the magic of the Gilbert and Sullivan operas by very pedantically ranking every element of them. And today we are going to be looking at the dialogue scenes from HMS Pinafore. So my initial impression after giving these a good read was that they seem to be roughly on the same par as the Sorcerer dialogue scenes. I think there are elements of HMS Pinnevor that are better. Mostly it's just the satire. There's so many things that are very clever and I think that when it comes to characterization I think Gilbert is definitely improving whereas there weren't too many very well-defined characters in The Sorcerer. I do think that the characters in HMS Pinafore are really well-defined and that the dialogue upholds those characteristics very well. So a lot of these scenes have got very high marks across the board. A couple of them have maybe fallen a bit flat on comedy, but generally these are all really good scenes. The lowest one got a 25 out of 40, the highest got a 38 out of 40. I'm using the same parameters I've used for my other dialogue videos, so you can go and have a look at that if you would like to. So number 12 I have given to the scene that precedes never mind the why and wherefore between the captain, Sir Joseph and Josephine. This one isn't at all bad, it's just very short and I think much like the Alexis Aline scene that I was discussing in the last Alec video, and interestingly it occurs at about the same point in the opera, there's like a big decision that's been made, there's a big turning point but yet there's not enough weight placed on it. And I don't think it particularly matters, actually, because Never Mind the Why and Wherefore is such a cracking song, and that portrays the energy and the weight of that decision, I think, far more than this dialogue ever could. I've now switched off my heater, so you won't have that noise in the background. <laughs> Madam, it has been represented to me that you are appalled by my exalted rank. I desire to convey to you officially my assurance that if your hesitation is attributable to that circumstance, it is uncalled for. And this isn't really the way that people speak, but it is accessible and it is understandable, so... great. <laughs> he little thinks how eloquently he has pleaded his rival's cause. That's, you know, a relatively funny line. But yeah, this is an absolutely fine scene, but there's just nothing that particularly wows me about it. I only gave it a five for comedy. There are no jokes in it, just apart from the whole misunderstanding that Sir Joseph is talking about, the difference between himself and Josephine, but Josephine's actually thinking about the difference between her and Rafe. So apart from that misunderstanding, which is more just for, oh, okay, it's not laugh out loud funny. I also only gave it a six for character and character progression because this is just all narrative. And even though the characters are somewhat representing themselves, it's stuff that we already know about them and it's not anything particularly groundbreaking. I did they give it a seven for the other two categories for importance to the narrative and beauty slash poetry because they are just perfect examples of Gilbert's general work. I don't think there's anything particularly memorable about this scene but there's nothing wrong with it. Number 11 I have given to the scene between Captain and Dick Deadeye just before Kind Captain I've important information. Again this is another scene that I by no means consider to be bad, it's just that it's just a little bit too short to really have many memorable moments in it. Still I do think this one does get a couple of extra points just because it does have one laugh out loud moment in for which I gave it a 7 out of 10 for comedy. So Dick says, I've come to give you warning. And the captain says, indeed, do you propose to leave the Navy then? And Dick says, no. <laughs> and I do find that very funny. Classic misunderstanding. But ultimately, it's just a very short scene. I only gave it a 6 for character progression and narrative importance, simply because it's too short to get across the information. And actually, the information is in the song, as per the title of the song. So the song is really the meat of this scene. I also gave it a 7 out of 10 for beauty slash poetry, because I think it does have a couple of lovely moments in it. Captain Corcoran, it is one of the happiest characteristics of this glorious country that official utterances are invariably regarded as unanswerable. This is what I really love about H. Miss Pinafore. It's very critical examining of the class system that we have. 
I have included as well the little bit after the song and Dick Deadeye's line. They are foiled, foiled, foiled. There's a lot of opportunity for comedy there. You can do two of them loud and get shushed and then do the last one quiet. You know, there's lots of things you can do with that. I've seen various hilarious people performing that line in various hilarious ways. And also just the idea that a boat cloak would provide ample protection. It is quite silly. And so that's why I think this one definitely gets a seven for comedy, but it doesn't rank too highly elsewhere. Number 10, I have given to the scene between Rafe, Dick Deadeye and the bosun that comes just before the captain's entrance. And as a side note, if anyone writes in the comments that it's actually the bosun's mate, I'm going to delete the comment because colloquially we do tend to refer to these characters as the bosun and the carpenter and only pedants would tell me I'm wrong about that. Anyway, again, this scene got a 27 out of 40. I think it's a perfectly good scene. It just doesn't have as many memorable lines as some of the ones above it have. But we further solidify some of their characteristics. Rafe, Dick Deadeye, the bosun, insofar as he has a character, he represents the feelings of the crew, which means that he will celebrate anything Rafe says, but then criticise Dick Deadeye when he says things that are very similar. <laughs> but I think there are some moments of tremendous beauty in this. For a man is a man whether he hoists his flag at the main truck or his slacks on the main deck. My lads, our gallant captain has come on deck. Let us greet him as so brave an officer and so gallant a seaman deserves. <laughs> I think part of the comedy from HMS Pinafore for me comes from the fact that sailors wouldn't necessarily speak like this. And I know that's the point but it's also a point very well made. And the joviality with which they speak and celebrate their captain, I find very endearing and rather unrealistic, but I think it's very nice and very silly and funny. And I think it was wholly intentional. And thank you, Gilbert, for giving me this joy. I tend to find that the traditionally male choruses are just funnier when they're very wholesome, and jolly and just completely carefree. Maybe with the exception of the peers they have to be very condescending and I've probably forgotten some others as well but when you think of this one, the pirates, the dragoon guards, it's just so fun when they're very silly and wholesome and like yes we do! <laughs> I love the sailors interjections in this show and there are a couple in this scene is also a no, no! <laughs> and there's a comma after the first no and an exclamation mark after the second no, which I think is intentional. Again, still up the bosun. So she won't have anything to say to a poor lad like you, will she, lads? No, no. Then Dick Deadeye agrees. No, no. Captain Sorters don't marry four mast hands. Shame, shame! <laughs> it's just so stupid. And I don't really see enough productions make a big thing of this difference and how that's really unfair <laughs> on Dick Deadeye. <laughs> and the fact that the reason he becomes what he is is because of this completely unfair treatment, which apparently is just based on what he looks like. It's very strange. So I think the issue with this scene is that it is a transition. It's not really designed to convey a lot of character or story. I did give it a seven for narrative importance and a seven for character because I did feel it reinforces things that we've already established, which I think is important. I gave it a seven for beauty slash poetry, but only a six for comedy. I think apart from Dip Dead Eye getting this unfair treatment, I don't really find much of this laugh out loud funny. Maybe the line that brings the captain on just because, as I said, it's so ridiculously jovial. <laughs> Number nine, I've given to a scene which doesn't really exist, or it does exist, but I am judging it based on a version of it that I used when I last directed HMS Pinafore, which I am informed by a reliable authority that this was the version that they used to use during the later doily cart years, and I'd be very happy for people to correct me. I very much trust my source, but I also don't know if perhaps I've misunderstood something. So I'm going to post the dialogue of this scene in the description so that you'll know exactly which version of it I'm using. And that is the dialogue between the captain, Sir Joseph and Hebe, which comes just before Josephine's 
big second act aria. The one on the GNS archive I don't trust because it seems that some of the lines are the wrong way around. Hebe says crushed again before she says crushed. It doesn't really make too much sense. So I really think the one that I've included in the description, which has been endorsed by people I trust, is the one to be using. And this is an example of a scene that, because it's funny, it actually takes away from its narrative importance. I think without the inclusion of Hebe, it would get across the narrative a little bit more cleanly, but because of Hebe's interjections, her constant interjections, it turns it into more of a comic scene, which I really do appreciate, because I think it is in keeping with the tone of the opera, and also it fleshes out Hebe's character and gives her something to do. I think in this format it's better for everything, apart from narrative importance, and I can Consider it better to use the best version of the scene. What's really interesting about this scene is the fact that Gilbert has obviously regurgitated the bits that he ended up not using in Hebe's character for Lady Jane later because it follows much the same pattern. So Sir Joseph comes on and expresses concern about his future marriage to Josephine all the while he's got Hebe beside him interrupting everything he says, which worked very well in Patience and maybe doesn't work quite as well here because Hebe isn't as well known a character at this stage, but I do really enjoy its inclusion. I gave it a 7 out of 10 for comedy. I do think it is funny, but I wouldn't really want to give it much more than a 7. Captain Corcoran, I am much disappointed with your daughter. Yes, we are much disappointed with your daughter. In fact, we don't think she will do. She won't do? Yes, Daenerys! She won't do! You see, that's what it's like. That's what it's like to have Hebe interfere. <laughs> Cousin Hebe, although your interference is well meant, I do not think it materially assists my cause. You do not? I do not. Crushed. It's very like Lady Jane. But then because we haven't seen much of Hebe before, it does feel a bit shoehorned in. And for that, I wouldn't give it more than a seven for comedy. I love the line that Sir Joseph says, that is really a very sensible suggestion and displays more knowledge of human nature than I had given you credit for. <laughs> what a thing to say to a person. <laughs> That's so stupid. And then there's some joke about the poop deck, which I'm not convinced I really understand, but hey ho. I gave it a seven for beauty slash poetry. I think it is much the same as Gilbert's standard. But I did give it an 8 for character, because I think that this opportunity to show the audience who Hebe is, is very important. And it further emphasises who the captain are, who Sir Joseph is, and their relationship, the way that they speak to each other. It further emphasises Sir Joseph's inability to really see that in ostensibly arguing that love is a platform on which all classes meet, and in being very empathetic to the so-called lower classes, he is actually coming across as quite snobbish, <laughs> and that I do find very funny. Coming in at number eight with 29 points, we have the scene between the captain and Little Buttercup, just after the captain's act two solo. So William Rummers and I were talking about this one in relation to the Captain's song, which I definitely marked too low for music. I don't think it would have affected its placement, so it's not terribly relevant, but I do want to re-emphasise that I hadn't realised how good the music was in that song. But anyway, that is beside the point. I do like this scene. It is very telling of both characters. You get to see, much like Sir Joseph in the last scene, the Captain display empathy towards somebody of a lower class but then still manages to put himself above them when it comes to what really matters. So he has allowed himself to open up slightly, but he won't go the whole way. And Little Buttercup is understandably quite put out by this, so I do enjoy the narrative of the scene. But I only gave it a seven for narrative importance because 
as I was referring to when I talked about the song that follows this, it does refer to things that we don't know about yet. And that's always a little bit frustrating when characters are alluding to a mystery that they've yet to reveal. And then there's a whole song about something that they can't talk about, which just means that it's two minutes when the narrative is stuck. And I don't think the characters really progress in that song either. But I do think in terms of character, this scene is very successful. I gave it an eight out of 10. Just seeing the captain almost open up and then back away and then Buttercup make herself very vulnerable as well. Because Buttercup is a very confident, very lovable character. And the fact that she put herself on the line here and said to the captain, well, that were unjust to one at least. That is very brave of her coming from a person of her position to a person of his position, and then to get rebuffed like she did. She takes it very well, I think. There's some beautiful language in this scene. True, dear Captain, but the recollection of your sad, pale face seemed to chain me to the ship. Oh, I think that's so lovely. And then his abrupt change of heart. True, for you are staunch to me. If ever I gave my heart again, methinks it would be to such a one as this. I am touched to the heart by your innocent regard to me. Oh, how patronising. And were we differently situated, I think I could have returned it. But as it is, I fear I can never be more to you than a friend. It's very patronising, isn't it? I do appreciate that in the later part of the scene, we do get some tension there. And I appreciate that this is something that the actor playing Buttercup could do but I would have appreciated that remark from the captain having a little bit more of an effect on her overtly in the text. So I think that I only gave it a seven for narrative importance because I do think there are ways in which it could have had a bit more emotional weight, but I do still really like this scene. I only gave it a six for comedy slash wit. I do think that the mystery does add a little bit of comedy. If he knew, if he only knew, you know that something's about to come at the end of the show and that is a change in store for you. So where it lacks in narrative importance, that does maybe give it one more mark for comedy. But ultimately, I think this scene is just a very good sketch of character and has some very beautiful poetry, but I wouldn't mark it highly for comedy. Number seven I have given to the pre-act two finale scene and as I was saying in the Sorcerer video often these pre-act two finale scenes are a little bit muddled and doesn't really give the characters much chance to develop any further or really show who they are very much but this I think is a relatively good one. We do get to see more of Sir Joseph's hypocrisy. He is championing lower class people all the way through this opera but then won't marry Josephine because love does level all rank but not as much as that. I gave this scene an eight for comedy because the situation is just so silly and the satire here is just wonderful. Sir Joseph does seem to genuinely believe that a person is born into a certain class and they will be happier in their life if they live in the class they were born into. And that is evidenced by the fact that he is congratulating both Rafe and the captain for their change of status. I congratulate you both when they appear again, which seems to imply that he feels like it's better now that people are in their natural places. And there's actually nothing inherently bad about being a lower rank in society, which we know is nonsense, and obviously Gilbert knew was nonsense, which makes it tremendously good satire because these characters are very believable and there are genuinely people that think that, that, oh, people are just happier, <laughs> you know, <laughs> living in poverty. <laughs> that's, that's just the way the world is. There are genuinely a lot of people that believe that. And for the cleverness of the satire, 
and for just the general ridiculousness of the situation, I'll give it an 8 out of 10 for comedy. I don't think there's any terribly laugh out loud lines, but just for those two things, I think it deserves a high mark. I also gave it an 8 out of 10 for narrative importance. As I say, I do think it wraps up the show really well. Yes, it does so in quite a contrived way, but I do think that was deliberate and I don't think it was lazy. I think it's been set up very well previously in the opera and the satire of HMS Pinafore and just the whole matter of a person being born a certain way, the idea that that is somehow a choice or just a way of being that can't be changed is just so clever and funny and the ending of HMS Pinafore only emphasises that. It's very different, say, to the ending of Iolanthe where they just change a word in a contract, which I'm not going to say it's lazy, I have no beef with the ending of Iolanthe, but this makes a point where Iolanthe doesn't. Maybe the point in Iolanthe is that laws are pretty arbitrary and can just be changed, maybe that's the point they were making, but the fact that this one has been so cleverly set up and it's about a topic which a lot of people do genuinely believe what Sir Joseph believes, I think just makes it very relevant and it's still very relevant today. I gave it a 7 out of 10 for beauty slash poetry. I don't think it's particularly mind-blowing but there are some very lovely lines in there. The aforementioned, it does to a considerable extent, but it does not level them as much as that. Yes Dora, you don't usually come and say hello do you? Yes Dora! Dora likes butt scratches. You gonna show them how you like your butt scratches, Dora? I'm very popular today. Are we popular or are we mad? <laughs> and then just the fact that Rafe doesn't cotton on to what Sir Joseph is saying. If what? I, I don't think I understand you. If you please. The gentleman is quite right. If you please. Oh! If you please. And I guess that could be played for last, but Rafe could genuinely be a bit offended by that. I guess that's up to the actor and the director, isn't it? <laughs> you are an extremely fine fellow. Of course, we hearken back to that earlier scene, which I love. But anyway, I do like this scene and I do think it is one of the more successful of the pre-Act 2 finale scenes in the canon. Number six I have given to the scene that precedes the octet, which is mostly between Sir Joseph and Rafe. This actually got the same mark as the one that precedes the Act 2 finale, but I do feel this scene is a little bit better. I gave it an 8 for beauty slash poetry because of Rafe's gorgeous lines, as he says to Josephine. She is the figurehead of my ship of life, the bright beacon that guides me into my port of happiness, the rarest, the purest gem that ever sparkled on a poor but worthy fellow's trusting brow. And I think that is lovely and it deserves an 8 because of that line and the other one that he says. I do think this scene highlights Sir Joseph's hypocrisy a little bit better than the one I discussed before does. The fact that he has been saying this whole time love levels all ranks, unless it inconveniences or embarrasses him. Sir Joseph does seem to be a little bit queer coded and I don't know if that was intentional on Gilbert's part. It does seem quite clear that he's not particularly interested in Josephine. He doesn't speak about her in the same way that Rafe does. He doesn't seem to have any particularly fond or kind feelings for her. She's just the person he's going to marry. But I think the main point here isn't that he's heartbroken, it's that he's humiliated. Because Rafe has taken away something that is rightfully his, as terrible as that sounds, and in front of everybody as well. So I feel that his anger at the situation isn't evidence that he's in love with Josephine. I think it's quite clear that Sir Joseph couldn't really care less about Josephine. And I think that the fact that this scene just has such high stakes, I do think merits it a slightly higher position than the one before it. I gave it a 9 for narrative importance for all the reasons I've just been talking about. Finally, Rafe and Josephine reveal their love to Sir Joseph and they've already revealed it to the crew but it's just done in such a public and overt way that even though they already know about it it still must be very powerful for the crew. I don't think they've ever heard Rafe talk in such language about Josephine while she's been present before. Yes, Dora! Dora! I know! 
I gave it a 7 out of 10 for character. I don't think we learn much more about Rafe and Josephine. That's already been established. Yes, even though it's beautiful language, we've heard it before. And I think it's good that it's included, which is why I gave the scene a 7. But apart from learning more about Sir Joseph's hypocrisy, you don't learn too much more about these characters. But they are certainly representing themselves, and I do appreciate it. I only gave it a 6 out of 10 for comedy slash wit. I don't think there's any laugh out loud moments in this scene. The sailors saying very pretty, very pretty is quite funny. And just Sir Joseph's immediate change of heart. Insolent sailor! Because it, it is so unashamed, the fact that he just immediately changes his mind about love levelling or ranks. Or oh, just it does, but not in this one instance where it affects me. Number five, I have given to the first dialogue scene of the show, which is the one between Little Buttercup the Bosun and Dick Deadeye. This one got really quite high marks across the board. It got an 8 out of 10 for beauty slash poetry, an 8 for narrative importance, an 8 for character, and a 7 for comedy. I don't think it's maybe quite as funny as some of the more laugh out loud ones, but I tend to think this is one of the best initial scenes in the canon. I think it's so successfully gets across the characters of Little Buttercup and Dick Deadeye. Immediately you know that Little Buttercup has a secret and it's delivered in a way that not only is narratively successful but it's also very funny because of the bosun's responses to it. But hark ye, my merry friend, hast ever thought that beneath a gay and frivolous exterior there may lurk a canker worm which is slowly but surely eating its way into one's very heart? No, my lass, I can't say I've ever thought that. <laughs> I know I said that line literally in the last video, but I just thought I'd say it again. Apart from the whole problematic nature of this scene, because it does seem that the sailors are only treating Dick Deadeye badly because of what he looks like, and this is a point that's been deliberately made to show how ridiculous that is, but because Dick Deadeye doesn't really get a redemption at the end, it's a bit, ugh, it's a bit awkward. But that line from such a face and form as mine, the noblest sentiments sound like the black utterances of a depraved imagination. That's a lot of the reason why I gave it an 8 out of 10 for beauty slash poetry. Dick Deadeye is such a well-crafted character. It's just a shame he doesn't really get redeemed at the end. But that line and his exchange with Buttercup and the bosun and the Buttercup's introduction as a person with a secret who is very lovable, I just think that that is so successfully got across very quickly. And for that, I really commend Gilbert in this scene. I don't think it's terribly laugh out loud funny. It's mostly just funny how unfair the sailors are treating Dick Deadeye and the bosun's response to Buttercup's dramatic mini speech. And apropos of what I was saying a few scenes ago, I absolutely love the sailors' interjections in this scene. Ha <laughs> ha! That's it! I'm ugly and they hate me for it. For you all hate me, don't you? We do! Because <laughs> the idea of lots of people speaking at once is inherently funny, but the fact that they're just openly telling this person, yeah, we hate you! <laughs> it's dark, but it's also very funny. So there's not much more to say about this scene. I don't think it is the best one in HMS Pinafore, but it's really high up because I just think it conveys narrative and character so successfully in a way that is very funny and it uses some beautiful language while doing so. Number four, I have given to the scene between Sir Joseph, the captain, Rafe and the bosun, which occurs after Sir Joseph's introductory number. Now this is one of the more famous scenes in Gilbert and Sullivan. It's got some very silly and funny moments in it. I gave it an 8 out of 10 for comedy. I also gave it an 8 out of 10 for character and a 9 out of 10 for narrative importance. I think Sir Joseph as a character gets across the narrative very well. He's really the representation of somebody who ostensibly wants all classes to be level, but in practice he doesn't actually stick by his words when it affects him. And I do think that this is perfectly encapsulated in this scene. I don't think it is the most beautiful when it comes to poetry, which is why it maybe didn't come higher. I gave it a seven for that. One of the things that a lot of people find funny about this scene, including me, is the queer coding of Sir Joseph, which 
it's generally done. I've seen very few productions that don't make something of this language that he has towards the sailors, especially Rafe, who he really, really likes. It is incredible when you think of just how generous his language is towards Rafe in a way that he just isn't at all towards Josephine. That initial line where he asks Rafe to step forward, but Dick Dead I thinks it's about him, and he goes, no, no, the other splendid scene. <laughs> Which is just lovely, it's just perfect. I am the last person to insult a British sailor, Sir Joseph. You are the last person who did, Captain Corcoran. Ooh, <laughs> I love that, it's such a burn. Sir Joseph is just a great character, he has some amazing lines. Can you dance a hornpipe? And then just Sir Joseph's disdain for the captain. After he, the captain's done nothing at all wrong. <laughs> I like to hear you speak well of your commanding officer. I dare say he don't deserve it. <laughs> it's, just, it's just so mean, but in a way that's kind of fabulous. He reminds me a little bit of these alto characters in a way. He is just fearless and unapologetic in the way he speaks. It is a song that I have composed for the use of the Royal Navy. It is designed to encourage independence of thought and action in the lower branches of the service and to teach the principle that a British sailor is any man's equal, excepting mine. It's just, he doesn't seem to notice his own hypocrisy, even though he is clearly a very intelligent person just by the way he speaks. Don't patronise them, sir, pray don't patronise them. <laughs> it's great. I do think this scene is really, really funny. Where I didn't give it really high marks, as I say, was the beauty slash poetry category. I only gave it an eight for character and an eight for comedy and wit. I think that even though Sir Joseph is portrayed very well, you don't really learn too much more about the other characters. It's more his scene. And for that, I could only give it an eight because it's focused on one person. And an eight for comedy and wit. I do think it's very funny, but when the comedy is based on an interpretation of the lines rather than the lines themselves, I do think that deserves a lower mark than the ones where the lines themselves are just hilariously written. Number three, I have given to the scene between the captain and Josephine in act one, which I happen to think is one of the most perfect examples of portraying character. Josephine and the captain come across very clearly in this scene. You really get to understand who both of them are after their initial introduction. Josephine's just sung her aria. The captain has had his whole introduction. I really think this is the perfect follow-up to their opening numbers. You really get to delve into them and learn who they are a bit and about their vulnerabilities. And also, they're so nice. The captain is so sweet towards Josephine and so understanding towards her. Yes, she does say almost immediately that she's not going to go ahead with this romance or tell Rafe what she feels about him, but the captain still does seem to be understanding in a way that you wouldn't really necessarily expect from a person of that time. And he definitely respects his daughter, he respects her opinion, and Obviously, he's enamoured of Sir Joseph, which I think is so lovely to get across because it makes it all the more crushing when you realise that Sir Joseph just treats him with utter disdain. But this scene, I just think, is a beautiful scene. It's one of those scenes where sometimes when you're directing something and want to give out audition material, it can be hard to know what material to pick. But for Josephine or the captain, this is just such a good scene to pick. If you gave the potential Josephines and captains this dialogue to read and gave them direction of how you want them to read it. You get a really good idea of who could play the part in the way you want it played. <laughs> but it's also got very beautiful language in it and it's also very funny. And it's mostly funny because of how earnest they're being. So the characters themselves don't believe they're funny and I think that's the case with a lot of Fields and Sullivan scenes. It's not like, oh, I'm saying a joke. It's funny because they're really convinced of what they're saying and truly believe it. One of the funniest lines in this scene for me is when Josephine admits to being in love with Rafe. The captain says impossible. And Josephine says, yes, it is true. Too true. <laughs> this is like another example of something which might seem 
irrelevant or not important, but to me that too true adds such a level of humour onto Josephine. It really encapsulates that upper class way of speaking. It is true. Too true. And the three I love hymns that she says. There's so much you can do with that because you can vary the levels of it. But, but I love him. I love him. I love him. But the language as well. I hate myself when I think of the depth to which I have stooped in permitting myself to think so tenderly of one so ignobly born. It's a lot to get your mouth around, but these lines are lovely and Josephine is such a well-crafted character. She is clearly extremely intelligent and is very opinionated and is proud but also vulnerable and you get that so clearly from this scene. Though I carry my love with me to the tomb, he shall never, never know it. Again, double word. Very important. And the captain, he's just so sympathetic of the situation. Come, my child, let us talk it over. Oh, it's a bit like Sergeant Merrill and Phoebe, isn't it? It's that really lovely father-daughter relationship. In a matter of the heart, I would not coerce my daughter. I attach but little value to rank or wealth, but the line must be drawn somewhere. A man in that station may be brave and worthy, but at every step he would commit solecisms that society would never pardon. They are just completely oblivious to how much harm these words could be causing. But there's something endearing about it when the Captain and Josephine say these classist remarks because they do seem to exist in a universe where what they're talking about is reality. It does seem like in this universe, to really emphasise the satire, where you're born is somewhat a choice and the class you are born into is something that you seek to choose in some philosophical sense. But see, Sir Joseph's barge approaches, manned by twelve trusty oarsmen and accompanied by the admiring crowd of sisters, cousins and aunts that attend him wherever he goes. So I gave this one an 8 out of 10 for beauty slash poetry and an 8 for narrative importance. It certainly gets across the main conflict of the story and indeed the conflict of the subplot because we have just learnt as well that the captain and Buttercup are embroiled in some kind of pre-romance. <laughs> and if you can get the actors in that scene to really get that across, then this scene also has resonance for the captain as well. You can actually attach emotion to his lines. He doesn't really want to believe in what he's saying, but that's just the way the world is. And that can actually be very powerful and very moving because we've just seen that actually he would love it if he could just dispense with rank and wealth and be with Buttercup without shame. But he does feel this sense of shame surrounding Buttercup, which is a shame. I gave it a 7 out of 10 for comedy. As I was saying, though I do find the scene very funny for its earnestness, I don't think it's laugh out loud funny in the same way that some other scenes are. But I did give it a 10 out of 10 for character, because as I was saying, it just so clearly gets across both characters and for that I commend it and it's a cracking audition scene and I just always enjoy the scene when I see the show. Captain and Josephine, great characters, great scene. Number two I have given to the scene that precedes the trio of British Tar which is between the bosun Dick, Rafe and the sailors. I gave it a 9 out of 10 for beauty slash poetry. A 10 out of 10 for narrative importance. I gave it a 9 out of 10 for character and only a 6 out of 10 for comedy. But apart from comedy, it ranks very highly in the other categories. What I love most about this scene is that it contains very high stakes and when the stakes are high, the narrative always seems to be a bit clearer. It just tends to make the audience listen a bit more. The story is conveyed more successfully when it seems like the characters really care what they're talking about. And the sailors are a tremendous help in this scene with their interjections. Well spoke, well spoke, horrible, horrible. The sailors say so much in this scene. And just Rafe's series of little speeches which just amp up the energy each time. Messmates, my mind's made up. I'll speak to the captain's daughter and tell her, like an honest man, of the honest love I have for her. Aye, aye. 
Is not my love as good as another's? Is not my heart as true as another's? Have I not hands and eyes and ears and limbs like another? Aye, aye. True, I lack birth. You've a birth on board this very ship. Well said, I had forgotten that. People like to draw attention to that joke by making it seem like the characters find it funny, but I, I like it when you don't at all drop the stakes and drop the tension and just plow on through. I think that's very funny. Messmates, what do you say? Do you approve of my determination? We do! I don't. <laughs> While I don't think that this scene is tremendously comic, I think the sophistication of Rafe's language, which does play a part in many of these scenes actually, and just the stakes behind it and the fact that it's a clear narrative turning point because up until this point we've just been meeting characters and understanding what it is they think. And this is the turning point. This is where one character clearly says, I'm gonna mess this all up. I am going to defy convention and tell the captain's daughter that I love her. Regardless of what she says, I'm just going to tell her. And without even considering if she's going to say yes, I mean, I can't imagine that Rafe is holding out much hope that she will say yes. It's just the point of telling her. He just wants to tell her. And I think that's wonderful. And the fact that Dick as well, no lines that he says in this scene and indeed the scene before it, maybe in a scene with the captain, he starts to get a bit unpleasant, but nothing he says here, is definitely antagonistic. His lines could be interpreted as trying to help Rafe and to warn him because Dick himself has been bullied apparently his whole life for the way he looks. So he's been used to wanting things and having dreams and those dreams being dashed. So of course he's going to warn Rafe about getting his hopes up. You're on the wrong tack and so is he. He means well, speaking of Sir Joseph, but he don't know. When people have to obey other people's orders, equality's out of the question. And the thing is, he's the one that's actually speaking the truth here. It's an uncomfortable truth, but that is actually the way the world is. And while there's not much use that can be gained by just overstating, well, that's just the way it is, we should be trying to shake things up. You can understand from Dick's perspective that it would be a very dangerous thing for somebody in Rafe's position to tell the captain's daughter that he loves her. The sailors are not very helpful in objecting to Dick Deadeye here. They're not being helpful by just dismissing what he's saying because Dick Deadeye does have real concerns and caution should be employed when pursuing this line of action that Rafe is going to pursue. It could have gone very wrong, if you think about it. Rafe could easily have been fired from his position and never have got another job again and then being forced to live in even more abject poverty than he was already living and then dying horribly in a gutter somewhere. But that would be a very different opera. <laughs> but still, Dick's need to point out that there are problems with what Rafe is considering doing is valid. Even if he's being a bit of a buzzkill, it is important to consider the state of things when trying to shake things up. Coming in at number one, and which will currently be my ultimate number one spot for dialogue with a score of 38 out of 40, and that is the scene between Rafe and Josephine before Refrain Audacious Tar. Again, much like the Captain and Josephine scene, the characters of the two people in the scene are portrayed so successfully. I gave it a 10 for beauty slash poetry and a 10 for comedy. I think the comedy actually comes from the sophistication of the language, but it also comes from the fact that Josephine is so clearly conflicted. When a character is so conflicted in the way that Josephine is, it means the stakes are really high. And when the stakes are high in a scene, but the language is very earnest, it just makes it very funny. And her initial line is just glorious. It is useless. Sir Joseph's attentions nauseate me. I know that he is a truly great and good man, for he told me so himself. <laughs> and then just all of her asides, how my heart beats. And why poor Rafe? <laughs> Haughtiness and then the emotional language towards the audience. But we actually get to, in this scene, 
One of my favourite lines in the canon. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that I think that most of my favourite lines are in the Mikado. At some point I'm going to rank my top 20 lines in Gilbert and Sullivan and I imagine that 10 of them will be from the Mikado, but this is one of the best lines in the canon. I am poor in the essence of happiness, lady, rich only in never-ending unrest. In me, there meet a combination of antithetical elements which are at eternal war with one another, driven hither by objective influences, thither by subjective emotions, wafted one moment into blazing day by mocking hope, plunge the next into the Cimmerian darkness of tangible despair. I am but a living ganglion of irreconcilable antagonisms. I hope I make myself clear, lady. <laughs> Because what Rafe is doing there is kind of making you more and more anxious and on the edge of your seat with every single thing that he says, which is so eloquent and beautiful. And then he just drops the tension and gives you that moment of relief. That is one of my favourite lines in all of Gilbert and Sullivan. And it shows such a clear understanding of that specific type of comedy. And Gilbert is a genius. And then Josephine's response to that his simple eloquence goes to my heart. <laughs> As in, that's just language that she uses on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, because she's just so fancy. And then his following line, which I won't read out, about Jove's armoury, the fact that whenever he says her name, it must just give her such a reaction, because the idea of a common sailor using her name is so powerful. This idea that he has uttered something quite sacred. The stakes could not be higher. The stakes in this scene are through the roof. And just imagine for anyone who has or will play Rafe, just the absolute joy and relief that he would get from just saying her name, just saying Josephine, and how much that can be luxuriated in, if that makes sense. And the fact that you can see her conflict and know how awful it must be for her to have to reject him, knowing, as the audience know, just how much she loves him. You shall not wait long. Your proffered love I haughtily reject. Go, sir, and learn to cast your eyes on some village maiden in your own poor rank. They should be lowered before your captain's daughter. Oh, I will hopefully get to play Josephine one of these days. I do like that character. But this scene, I just think, is one of the most perfect scenes in Gilbert and Sullivan. I didn't give it a perfect mark. I am reserving that for scenes in other operas. I do imagine that some may do better than it later. But it seems like the dialogue in Pinafore, I like just as much as the Sorcerer. The Sorcerer, I think the lowest scoring one was 26, and the lowest and the highest was 36. And this we had 25 to 38, so there was a tiny bit of a wider range of scores, but generally they were much the same. I didn't think any of the scenes at all were bad, much like The Sorcerer. And the characters are always portrayed so well. I gave one scene a five for comedy, but apart from that, nothing got lower than a six, and usually not lower than a seven. I think all these scenes are at a very, very high standard. It's going to be interesting when we get into later operas, and I'm going to start to see all these dialogue scenes getting the same marks over and over again, and how I'm going to rank them together. And I may have to re-rank them with a different set of parameters just to try and get a wider range of scores at the end, but I will let you know if I end up doing that. As a side note, Full Bear Theatre are going to be performing HMS Pinafore at Ettington and possibly even London in August this year, so watch out for that. I'm going to be releasing information about that shortly. But that has been the HMS Pinafore Dialogue. I hope you have enjoyed this video and I don't know what's coming next, but I hope you will enjoy that one even more. So have fun with your lives. <laughs>